Thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, um, though I will be introducing a lot of evidence, I, I'm sometimes emotional too, and I hope I can express how much this work is, I think it means uh, uh, to, to me and to the work of UNICEF and uh, uh, to the advantages of the children we work for. Um, I'd like now also to say thank you to the organizers and thank you for my invitation and the opportunity to share with you uh, what has been the, about 12 years work on um, understanding children's outcomes and policies for children um, and uh, how policies uh, can be improved. And from the outset, it's probably good to reiterate some of the words we've just heard that in terms of the education system, there's a lot of advantages here in Belarus. Uh, and we'll look at some of those statistics. Um, but like every country uh, in, yeah, certainly, certainly in Europe and equivalent to many high-income countries, uh, work continues. Uh, things can be improved, can always be improved. Um, some of the key social statistics for children, uh, despite having heard earlier that living standards are, are going up, some of the key social statistics for children around poverty, around educational outcomes, around mental health, around participation and inclusion are not getting better. They're actually getting worse. And so we need to, need to keep our eye on the ball and we need to keep working hard on our systems. Okay, I trust my translator, uh, but I don't know what it says up there. It looks very nice, but I don't know what it says. So I, I'm, I hope uh, you, you can take the main messages uh, from here. Normally I speak too long, uh, so I start by telling you what I want you to know at the beginning, and then I will try and prove why I want you to know it. Um, I'm not going to, to tell you that, social, uh, that school systems uh, uh, can change the lives of children by themselves. I also don't believe that learning in any country is determined solely by the work of the education system. I'm going to make an argument that child protection, poverty measures, health measures, and school all together work to improve the lives of children. And I'm not going to make the argument that any country should spend more on their education system. Now, this might sound contrary to common understanding, um, but sometimes uh, um, our systems are not very effective. And putting more money into them is like putting, pouring water into a broken bucket. And we need to work out the, the quality of the system at the same time as we work out how much can go into the system. Also in recent years, school systems have worked to do more than just learning. And there's great pressures on all economies uh, for their schools to maximize learning because everybody's watching. Everybody is reading the PISA tables or the Tim's and the Pearl's tables, and they're talking about learning. But schools were not originally designed just to deal with learning. They were designed to care for children, to help with health, to work for employment, not simply literacy. And I think we would do ourselves a favor if we went back to some of that. And schools also take up the majority of spending on children. Uh, any major economy, for every $5 it spends on children, three goes to compulsory school. That's not including childcare. So when we think about how to do better for children, um, we have to understand that we're putting a lot of our efforts into one system. So focusing on how that system really works well, it's going to be an advantage to, to all of us. So we'll talk a bit about that. And um, so all in all, I, I, I'm going to make the case that education policy to improve the quality of secondary education, education more broadly, for the purposes of improving lives for children means we need to think harder about not just how much is spent, but how it is spent and when it is spent and with what else it is spent. Early investment matters, and pre-secondary school will not be efficient if preschool is, is not efficient. Uh, poverty matters. In every rich country in the world, according to PISA, poorer children do, on average, worse than richer children. And if you have a country full of poor children, 
your education system will be suboptimal. Home factors matter, how many brothers and sisters you have, what mum and dad can offer you. And um, as we, the, the last and I think an important thing to consider, though this is my last point, is that once I've tried to make the case uh, for optimizing education systems, I want to talk a little bit about how difficult it is to change something which is so central to our systems. It determines how we go to work. Um, education systems are, are almost an unmovable, inflexible part of the way our, our whole economies work, our whole systems and societies work. Uh, but if we're going to change them, we need to start thinking about it now. So I made the point that Belarus has got a lot of strengths. Belarus is investing about 5% of GDP on education, and it has done for a while. Uh, this is equivalent to uh, um, other countries in the region. It's equivalent to high-income countries, and it's, it's quite a lot higher than, than middle-income countries. So uh, if, if, if education system is a body, there's lots of blood in it. There's lots of, there's lots of money in your system, and it, and it compares well to other countries. Um, outside of the education system, the other things that matter to getting uh, education systems working well are policies for families and children. What this graph shows you is the proportion of GDP that is spent on policies for families and children. Uh, Belarus is in the green. You can see it's just below the OECD average. And Belarus is spending about 1.45% of GDP in cash benefits for families. And the remainder, which is almost 1% of GDP, is going on preschool services. If you look at the United Kingdom and Ireland in that picture, they spend a lot on cash. Uh, these, these are countries with not very strong child well-being outcomes. If you look at Denmark and Sweden and Finland, where we know there's stronger outcomes for children, there's a lot more money going on services. I want to talk a little bit about that later. Um, so it's just good to, to acknowledge that as, as we go. This is a, a funny old picture. It's, um, it shows how much is spent on children, how that money that we've just looked at, that GDP, is spent on children as they grow. If you look at the x-axis the, along the bottom, that's the ages of children. How much money is spent when a baby is born through to when the, when the, the person then is age 29. And that's the average for OECD countries. So what I want to point out there is that big block, the biggest part, that's education spending. The blue part at the bottom, that's cash. And the white part, that's childcare. That little thin, dark blue line, that's where all of the money goes related to child protection, accommodation, nutrition. It's very, very small in comparison. But it gives you an indication of when in the life course that money is being spent. Now, that little dip around age two, where there seems to be less money going into the system, that's common in all OECD countries. That means we pay a lot of money when a baby is born, and then we leave the family to deal with the baby and all of their work, and then we appear a few years later to provide childcare. Now, anyone would guess when, when that might be a problem. Uh, it shows a, a dip in investment and a depreciation in families' own capital and resources, uh, which affect things like mother's employment, which we'll see later is very important for making our systems work well. These circles represent how much money is spent when a child is going to compulsory school on different parts of the system. The OECD average, I don't have the data for Belarus, I'm sorry. The OECD average shows that 75% of money on children between the ages of five and 15 is spent through the compulsory school system. The majority of the rest is in, is in cash. So um, if we're looking to improve the outcomes for children, and we're looking to build a strong uh, uh, set, a strong generation, a generation full of human capital in order to take our countries uh, uh, into the future. Um, 
we need to, I, I think this chart, of all the charts show how important it is that we use our school systems well, that we, do, we use them wisely, that they're well designed. Because if our school system fails, 75% of our efforts on children are gone. So what are the key points from this, this, these few slides? They're worth reiterating. Uh, optimal investment theory suggests we should spend more earlier, and most countries don't. Uh, there should be key points in the life cycle when parents have to be out of work, or when children need to be prepared for school, or when you enter adolescence, where there should be, we should be able to see quite unique bits of service intervention, and we don't see that so well. Um, we know from the evidence that home environments contribute to a large proportion of what determines educational outcomes, but they only amount to a very small amount of public investment, so that seems to be uh, contradictory. And though I hadn't really spoken about this, when we talk about education spending, it's very different from cash spending, because the money we spend on education is locked. It's locked in schools, it's locked in contracts, and that money is, is path dependent, we say. What you spend last year determines what you spend next year, and that affects the, the, the way we can optimize the system. And I said I'd come back to that, which I will. So this chart here looks at, I've, what I've done is I've broken up the spending in different types by different parts of the age group, and I've just done a simple correlation matrix. Please don't take this as, as, as absolute truth. It's just association. But we're just exploring right now whether type and timing of spending affects certain outcomes more than others. And I've used colors uh, to make it easier to read without you having to look too hard at the numbers. The darker the color, the stronger the association. Uh, what you can see from this chart is that most of our, the, the work of the system and the spending in the system of different types loads more on child poverty than it does on other aspects. Perhaps what's interesting here, the two things I want to show you, oh, oh, hang on. one, that's it, that, it, that in child poverty it loads more, um, and in, in education, uh, uh, certainly in primary school, uh, the amount of spending doesn't seem to have a strong association with many outcomes and actually is negative with, with the PISA ranking. Um, and there's not much better uh, when you look at later education spending. And I actually want to use this to make a point about education spending, which is worth reiterating. Uh, how much you spend on a child in, in a school can increase uh, by, by adding more money to the system, but it can also increase by removing children from the system. If you have less children, but you stay, you spend the same amount because your capital is locked, you don't sack teachers and you can't make schools smaller and all of your spending is path dependent. Sometimes we see education per capita spending increase when actually our social outcomes are getting worse. More children are out of school. And this type of statistical anom anomaly creates these types of problems with this type of evidence. So what I'm trying to say is, when I said, don't pay too much attention to this, I'm using it to make that point rather than more sophisticated points I hope to make in the next few slides. Uh, this slide here uh, looks at relative child income poverty just to, just to set some outcome uh, um, this is just for information. I'm not going to talk about it too hard. I've, I've, I've uh, uh, compared Belarus's um, child poverty rate, which is there about 12% in 2016. There's a little asterisk there because it's measured differently to the way it's measured in the other countries. Um, uh, that's to do with equivalization scales. Um, but I think even if it was measured the same, the poverty rate in Belarus would be lower than most of these countries. And this is a good, strong position to start in. This one here, oh, these are all um, indicators from SDGs. So you'll see I've put the SDG number, that's the Sustainable Development Goals number ne next to it. Uh, this, this one shows, as I said before, the, the points difference between rich and poor children 
in those countries. On P in Pisa, um, a child in Bulgaria that is higher up the income scale will on average perform 42 points higher in the PISA scale. Now most people who work with PISA will tell you 42 points is equivalent to a year's schooling, or 40 points is equivalent to a year's schooling. So um, by, by addressing issues of poverty, we can immediately make school outcomes better. We don't have data for Belarus yet, but I believe that the government is considering engaging in the PISA survey, which I think would be an excellent step forward. Uh, this data is on um, NEAT, that's the not in education, employment or training. The children in, in Belarus, particularly, the, the, the data for Belarus there is for, for children aged 15 to 24, so some of them are not, are not children. In the other countries, it's 15 to 19, which is why I've kept it out of the chart. Um, you can see it's, it's, it's above average compared to the out-of-school rate for, for younger children. Um, but it's a good indication of whether or not our school systems are working well when we look at how many children leave the school system and don't go into education, they don't get a job, and they don't do training. I, th I think that poverty and inactivity is a luxury. I know that sounds crazy, but countries cannot afford to have 12% of young children, or sorry, young, young adults, um, not working. So I use the word luxury in a, not as a literal luxury, uh, but uh, uh, this is an expensive waste in, in everybody's systems. This last chart is uh, the children in preschool year, childcare use in the preschool year, and you see in Belarus, the data is exactly comparable uh, um, to, to the data that's collected there for the SDG indicators. And Belarus' situation is really very strong. And we'll show that childcare is an important determinant of both, 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 an important determinant of both lower poverty rates and improved educational outcomes. The next thing I want to do is, having shown you some key statistics on children, is, is, is ask you to read them with caution. I want you to be very cautious about how you interpret statistics for children, and here is an example of why. This is the data, uh, this date, this, these lines um, show uh, non-response in the PISA surveys in the first four years. And I've mapped those, the non-response is across the bottom, from uh, zero to 10 means the child answers all of the questions, uh, to 130 plus they answered almost no questions, and on the y-axis is the average PISA score. The data we're using to inform child well-being and children's outcomes comes from surveys where children who are more educated can tell us what their lives are like, and children who are not educated cannot tell us what their lives are like. When we study preschool tests using PISA, those children that, have not, that cannot tell us whether they went to preschool or not perform, on average, four years worse in terms of educational outcomes. And it's, I don't know whether they've been to preschool or not, we just don't know. They also can't tell you what their parents do for a job, and they can't tell you how wealthy their family is. But we use that data to inform optimization of our, of our school systems, and that's, a, that's problematic. Another caution, and this is again um, reflecting all surveys of children, uh, is the number of children who are excluded from school, a uh, mainstream school, because of special educational needs. These children are considered to have intellectual disabilities and so are taught in different schools or different classes. Uh, I'm looking at data for European countries in 2008 on, uh, on the x-axis and 2010 on the y-axis. I look at two years because this is notoriously uh, uh, unreliable data, countries don't record it very well, so those two years gives an indication of how accurate that data is. Um, and I want to point out a couple of things, that sometimes our countries that do very well on our school-based surveys, like Finland, uh, can have a high number of children excluded from mainstream school. And sometimes our countries that look very similar uh, to Finland but don't do so well on PISA, 
include more children into the, in their school systems. Now, it may be that we're looking at some outcomes that look good for Finland, high PISA scores, and look bad for Sweden, low PISA scores. Uh, but actually, if we think about a, a goal for the school system of being inclusion and not literacy, I would argue that Sweden is doing a better job than Finland. So when you read any statistic, think a bit hard about, about exactly whether it's what you want your school system to achieve. Uh, some might argue that what we see in Sweden is a much more progressive step forward for school systems uh, and more countries should be following that example. I should say that PISA's, PISA tells us that only 5% of children are excluded from any survey and a maximum of 2% of children with their special educational needs are excluded. Um, but the data that we can see, like in the US in 2006, shows maybe 3% of children are being excluded. So uh, be cautious. In terms of uh, what works in schools, this is a review of the Education Commission last year. Um, and this is, this is my point to schools cannot do it all alone. Just look at the colours. The green colours show what efforts in the school are, are being undertaken, the teaching and teaching quality and learning effects, uh, the, sorry, teaching quality on learning and access effects. Uh, the ones in grey are things that we would say are exogenous to or outside of the school system. So, these, so that's what, how school effects affect our learning and access outcomes. But you can see that things that go on outside of the school system are as strong, if not stronger, for some of the goals we're trying to achieve in school. That's just worth bearing in mind for now. To take the analysis a bit further, I know that we're interested in needs here in Belarus. Uh, when I was at OECD, I did some work that correlated 20 years of spending on family and education policies, scholarships and active labour market policies with neat rates in those countries. And what you can see in this chart is the spending in services at the top on public expenditure on tertiary education and public expenditure on active labour market policies are strongly associated to lower rates of need. So more money in higher education, more money in active labor market policies, lower need rates. In cash expenditures, well, there's also some lower effects. But these are just associations. What we did next is we controlled for the size of the economy, the size of the sectors, how many people worked in service industry, how much money was going to other parts of the system, uh, and adult unemployment. And all of those associations disappeared except for active labour market policies, which retained a significant negative effect on NEAT rates. What happens in, the, what happens in terms of sector effects, uh, you can see in blue those that are significant, is that when the economy is weak, younger children stay in school as a protective factor. And when the economy is, is, is weak, older youth actually suffer along with adults. Uh, uh, we need to bear this in mind. And actually the service sector, in, for both industries, the more people who actually work in the service industry, the harder it is for young people to get on the, the employment ladder. According to 20 years of data for OECD countries, carefully lagged and uh, well analyzed. The next thing I want to talk to you about is is not just how much is um, spent or how is, it, how is it spent and not just comparing cash and in kind, but when you put money into services, how that service money is spent also has an influence on whether or not we get the social outcomes we want. I've, I've put this in nice color because we're going to look at the results using colors in a minute. Um, so the last piece of analysis I did at OECD before I left was to see how, uh, how childcare money was spent in different countries, how that interacted with how much was spent, so how strong was your bucket and how much water was in it, how did that affect poverty rates for young families. And so we took all of these years of countries, we took 22 OECD countries for 13 years and we put them into four categories. If your system has a universal childcare system everyone can go, like Belarus, um, 
and you have some payments sometimes for families, and when you go and have a baby in hospital, you don't have to pay, then you're a public system. If you have none of these things and sometimes can get free birth care, you're a private system, and then there's a couple of, couple of cases in between. This is how the countries we looked at uh, appeared in, in these typologies. Uh, Estonia's at the bottom in the private types. I would imagine that Belarus would be in the public type at the top. This these are the results. Now that's lovely and complicated, but this is why I have the colors uh, to help. Um, what that chart shows is average spending across these 13 years running along the x-axis, where zero is average spending, and average poverty rates over those 13 years in all of those countries, where zero is the average, on the y-axis. And each line, each color, represents one of our types of, of spending. And where, you, where the bars are thick, that means we saw, we observed a country spend that much money and get that poverty outcome. We controlled for all sorts of other factors, including family type, economy size, etc. But to clear this up, let's just look at those two. That's the public type and the private type. We were interested to know whether putting more money into these systems would result in better outcomes. And according to this analysis, if you put more money into one of these systems, you can expect better outcomes. If you put more money into the private system, you might well expect worse outcomes. Now, why might that be the case? If you're putting money into a private system that already benefits higher income families, you make it cheaper for the higher income family to access the service, and it stretches earnings inequality. And earn, stretched earning inequality is going to stretch uh, poverty. Um, I'm, selling, I'm telling you this uh, um, without the, I, I can send the paper, we've done the background to follow these associations, the pathways of these associations. We have an indication here, when we go back to these slides, these lines, we have an indication here that um, if you were to put more money into systems that neither are public nor private, the amount of money spent doesn't seem to affect the poverty outcomes. Those results um, were reviewed, peer reviewed, reviewed by every OECD country, and the, the ministries read those results, and those results were passed using the, the, this is the OECD review process. Um, just to be clear, I know it's complicated analysis, uh, but I, I, I didn't do it by myself on my own. <laughs> okay, let's move on. The last uh, slide I want to show you is how the childcare system, and particularly how public childcare systems can affect poverty reduction better than private childcare systems. And as I say, Belarus is in a good, strong position. What we're missing here is the maternal employment rate. Um, but there's a lot of data here. The green dots is what the poverty rate would look like if nobody had childcare. The yellow dots are what poverty rate looks like now for families with children zero to seven. And the red dots is what poverty rates would look like if you gave them the money instead of the service. So, it costs me $10 to provide you a day of childcare. If I gave you that money instead, it would lower your poverty rates by that much. In Denmark and France, very, very similar systems. The Danes have a much stronger poverty reduction effect for childcare because uh, they um, have a small uh, fees system which claws back some of the advantages of rich families which lowers the, the earnings inequality, which is one of the main drivers of inequality and child poverty. Okay, I'm gonna skip this because I'm not sure, I think I'm, I don't know how much time I've got left. Five minutes. Okay, this is, a, this, is a comp this is another piece of work we've done um, at, at UNICEF, we just did this at UNICEF and it's about to be published. Uh, this is a meta-analysis of longitudinal studies that link 
well-being earlier in the life course to learning later. Again, it's to show you that factors outside of the education system really matter. In amongst this list, the items that most predicted educational returns in late childhood were how well you did in primary school, which is no big surprise, but whether or not you've been ill, whether children work, what your life skills look like, how your non-cognitive skills, family income, and family instability. If we go back to that list, only one of them is prioritized in educational systems across all high-income countries, and that's early achievements. All of the rest, with similar strong effects, but they're the job of other parts of the system, and that's why we should be cross-sectoral. The last thing I want to say, and there's a couple of slides on this, is how the school should work as a way of influencing other outcomes. And I said to you that schools were originally designed to do much more than learning. Schools were meant to be the center of a community. They involved multiple child welfare policies, nutrition policies, health, and so on. Um, at the moment, most high-income countries are working to improve mental health in schools. Mental health in schools is a particular problem. There's higher rates of bullying, mental health issues across the border increasing. I have to move quicker, but some of the ways they do it there by providing literature, improving identification methods. But we're still learning in this area, and there's lots more work to do. But it's a good area to work with because schools are where most of our money goes and our children are experiencing more mental health problems, and mental health affects learning, and you can see I'm trying to piece everything together. But one of the issues with implementation, and I said I would talk about implementation, one of the big issues is here. In every country, in most countries, in, in high-income countries, and the same is true for Belarus, is the average salary for a teacher is lower than the average salary for the, the, the average worker. It's about 30% lower in Belarus. And when teachers are asked to do more, and when they're asked to bring other professionals into their system, of course it creates difficulties. Across the OECD, though, there's many, many good examples of how to work, schools can work better with the rest of the education system. Um, we talk, let's talk about equipment and clothing grants. It's France, Ireland, Israel, Korea, and Portugal, and free school meals and breakfast clubs. Some of this is here in Belarus, but we know that some of it isn't. Some of it isn't that though your school is free to access, um, costs around some food supplements and some textbooks exist. And of course, if you're from a poorer family, that's going to be harder to deal with than if you're from a better off family. So I will stop with this slide. I'm sorry to have gone on a bit longer, but I suppose this is, this is perhaps what you're all, I hope you're waiting for this slide. <laughs> what, does it, what does this mean for, for Belarus? Well, as I said, Belarus is in a very strong position in terms of its access, in terms of its childcare, in terms of its spending. Uh, and that needs to be maintained. But spending is only part of our, of our puzzle we need to make sure that the rest of our system supports our education system. We need to ensure that providing for families is, is, is seen as an investment and, and uh, at all parts of the system. And we resist bringing means-tested benefits too strongly into family delivery. If you want to mean-test your benefit, do it around housing, do it around social insurance, social assistance, not when it comes to investing in children. And we need to be conscious about the macroeconomic context. When things are bad in the economy, sometimes it's bad for children. Um, and uh, perhaps the last thing is that I, I know you're considering PISA. I think this is excellent. If you don't know what's happening in your school systems, how can you evaluate what you do? But I hope I've shown that PISA, like all of the data, should be used very cautiously. Uh, use it for the good of Belarus and don't get too excited and, and caught up in where you stand. Rather, what it can teach you to make lives better for children here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dominic.